Welcome back everybody. In this module, we're going to learn about input and we're going to learn about a new technique to solve coding problems called umpire technique. And we're going to learn about how to write Python functions. So let's get started. So this is the coding template that I'm going to use going forward throughout the class. Then I will put this descriptive class code to the canvas. So that's the goal. Okay, so let's get started with our lesson. So already we know how to output to the screen. So we know how to print to the screen. But what about the input? You already worked with the data we already have in the code. But what if we want to input data while the program running? So in Python, we can use input function for that. Okay. So there's a built-in function called input. And we can actually pass a prompt to input. And then, then we, we can use the input function, function to input data into a running program. Okay. All right. So, so here's an example. So imagine you have Python want to get your name as an input. So we use name equals and we call the input function and we pass the prompt enter name so just to be clear if you don't enter anything then basically python prompt will just blink empty sitting there and we may not recognize that so it's always good to pass uh, a prompt okay all right so let's move on notice that the return value of input it's text type or string type, okay? So that means we need to convert if it's otherwise. For example, if you want to get the age, you know that it's number of years, it's an integer. So then we need to convert that input to an integer. And for that, we, knew, we use the respect to data conversion built-in function. In this case, this is an this is a string. This whole thing is a string input. And then we pass this that whole thing into integer int function to convert that string into an int. Okay. So let's check this out now. So we're going to go back to coding and notice the format. I put the slide number and then I also print it in the output. And then in between, I write my code. So this is going to be slide number two. Okay. So and I will I will I will always write the title of the slide as well. Okay. But to save time, I'll I may not write it here, but before I post my code, I'll put it there. All right. So let's get the input, okay? So let's say name equals input. I'm gonna first run it without using, okay? So I'm, I'm running it in main program. I just need to run it there, okay? So, and then just after getting the name, just print name, okay? All right, so we can run this now. All right, so it's now, you can see that it's it's nothing in there, but it's waiting for an input, okay? So I'm gonna enter indicator, okay? Hit enter and it printed the indicator, okay? All right, so, so how do we solve this, you know, no prompt in the input? We can 
pass a pump. So enter main. Okay. All right. So run it again. It'll ask enter name. So it's sitting there now. So in the it's the name, hit enter and it printed my name. Okay. So that's how input function work. Okay. So notice it's asking while the program running. So it's a runtime or dynamic thing. Okay. And it in the Python prompt, it's it it's gonna wait until looking for until you enter your input. Okay. All right. So now let's see how we can input other data types. Okay. So I'm going to say age input. Well, first we need to convert it to an int and then input. Okay. Okay. And Enter age, All right? So let's now run this. I'm going to put print both together. Okay. So run this. All right. So name Vika age forty five, and printed. Um, but I said, okay, uh, did I print it? Okay. Yeah, over here. All right. So now let's see why this is, why, why, why do we have to do, right? So let's print the type of name, okay? So, sorry, print. type type of name okay and that's we'll see that it's a string type All right so i'm going to in the curve and you can see that it's a string type so just direct input without any conversion, it has the type string, okay? All right, so let's move on, okay? Now, our next slide is going to be on basically learning a new technique to solve problems. Well, let's find out how, okay? We call it umpire technique. So it's actually, the name came from, it's an acronym, okay? It's a new, it's it's formulated, I think it's formulated by CTI program, um, or uh, uh, maybe the code, code path. So anyway, it's a new technique to solve any problem I would say, but specifically, coding problems. All right. So first letter come from, first letter of umpire is you come from understand. Okay. It's really important step of solving problem, right? Clarify what the problem asked. Okay. Clarify what the problem asked. That includes reading it several times as well and work out an example. It's, it's really important to work out an example. Okay. And, and by the way, guys, I am telling you, jumping to code, just even without reading the, the problem, it's basically hitting your head into a wall. Uh, it's really hard. It takes time. And it's the worst way to start writing code. Okay. So we need to first understand. Hey, next step, match. We have experience, we gain experience writing solving problems. So if you can find a closely matching problem that you have, 
you sold previously, and that's going to help to devise a solution to your new problem. And in fact, sometimes it could be really close example that is going to help you immensely by recalling that that problem you previously solved. So it's really un important to find a match. Okay, it could be a pattern, could be a previously solved problem. Plan. So once you are done with the understand and match, you are certain a pathway to solve your problem or a recipe. Okay. So basically, now you can write a step, bunch of steps towards a solution. So we call this in English, like in plain English, it's steps or algorithm or pseudocode. Basically, you are code in plain English, not in plain Python, okay? Or any other programming language, okay? So that's the plan. So basically in, in here, you write down your steps, your algorithm. Implement. Once you are done with the English code, then it's a matter of implementation into Python code. Basically, it's a translation. So once you have a sound algorithm, translation is really easy and you'll see that, okay? And then review. In the review process, now our code is ready. We implemented our code, we run it or we test out few examples. So take some of the examples and test it out and run it. So running and testing your code is the review process, okay? Finally, evaluate. So now we came up with the problem, but it may not be the optimum solution. So we can go several, even several round to optimize our code. We can ask, okay, where we can improve? Can we improve by number of lines of code? Can we improve the, the speed? Can we improve the memory usage? So that's the step of last step, evaluate. This evaluation, if you are came up, come up with the best solution, that's fine. But more often, we come up with the non-optimal solution because the really optimal solution is complex. So in that case, we can uh, walk back and then towards the, the optimum solution. Now this process, if you practice this from many, many times, then you're gonna get an expert on this process. And if you practice this process in an interview problem, you're gonna nail that interview. Okay, so let's practice Ampere technique, okay? So the problem is, so we have now problem to solve. So given a four digit positive integer number, reverse the number numerically, use the Ampere process, okay? So I'm going to use the Ampere process to solve uh, this problem. Okay, so what's the first step? Okay, first step is copy paste this problem into your code editor. Okay, never stare at an empty code editor screen in trying to solve a problem without copying down the problem as code come into your code editor. So that's what I have done over here. I already set up a template as well. And you can do so as well, okay? So it's the Ampere technique, pair process, all the steps, understand, match, plan, implementation, review, and evaluation, okay? And some of them basically evaluation, review, you may not need it here, but definitely the rest, okay? So I already copied the problem, given a positive, integer number so i'm gonna make it uh, easy to readable okay so so let's read the, the problem given okay so first step is copy paste the problem given to you into a into your editor okay 
in my case PyCharm, I already set up a template as well. Right? So given, let's read the question again. Given a four digit number, integer number, reverse the number numerically. So my first step is to identify what is given to us, which is the input. That's the given thing, input. So four digit number. So let's take that out and write over here. So we are basically digesting the problem, All right? Okay, so the next one, what's the expectation? The output, okay? So this is what we need to output, okay? And then basically we need to reverse the number. All right, we need to output reverse number, reversed number, okay, let's say like that, okay. All right, and there are restrictions. We can also write that out as well. Restrictions, okay. And that is only numerically, okay. All right, so we are having to do this numerically, okay? All right, so understand process involves analyzing the prompt given to you. And for that, you can use the code editor, you can use a scratch paper and a pencil, you can use digital uh, drawing pad, anything that you can use. So in this case, I'm going to use Google Jamboard, okay? And work out an example, okay? So let's do that now, okay? So I'm going to take an example number, let's say one, two, three, four, okay? And the output is, so this is input, And the output should be right four, three, two, one. Okay. All right. So now let's digest this input. Okay. So I have one, two, three, four. Okay. So now I, I need to basically reverse this that means last number comes first and then the second likewise two one okay now excuse me i need to in order to do this i need to basically extract each of these digits once I have each digit extracted, okay? So it's, it's sort of a two-step process. First, we need to extract the digit, and then we need to form this number, right? Now, hypothetically, imagine I have the digits available, one, two, three, four, then basically we need to form this number, right? So how do we form this number? Basically, is the, the main task in this problem solving, okay? So let's imagine we have the digits available for three, two, one, okay? And how the number four, three, two, one form? And for that, we just basically analyze that number. So how that number is formed fundamentally is like this, four times, thousand okay and three times hundred plus two times ten plus one time one okay now that is 
the equation to form the number. Now you can see the pattern, the relationship between the digits and these numbers, right? So this is this, this is this, this is this, and this is this. Okay. All right. So what we have to do is basically extract the four digits and use this equation. Okay. So we are given for the number is for four digits. So we don't have to worry about a larger or smaller number. Okay. So let's, so that's our understands it. So we understand, okay, this is what we have to do. Extract four digits and then form that number. You already know how to extract a digit from a number. And if you if you haven't watched, I encourage you to watch the previously posted video into the second module. But it's it's usually easy. You can use the two operators, the remainder operator and the integer division operator to extract digits. Okay. So basically. I'm not going to explain that process, okay? But in the in the in the in the in the plan, I will explain how. Okay. So, so what is the match? In one of your programming assignment, you already have uh, given a, a, a plan. I think it's a three-digit number. Given a three-digit number, uh, return the product. Uh, maybe. No, swapping, right? So I forgot, I'm sorry. But it's, it's, uh, we can quickly check as well. So let's go and check. We already have a match that is, All right, so let's find out a match for this problem. We already have a match in our second assignment. We solve swapping the first and the last digit. So given an integer number, four, two, three, five, swap the first and last digit. So let's write that down. So it's, a, it's, a, it's actually a really good match because we extract the two digit and then this swap. So it's really close example, actually. First and last. And you can write, okay, modulo operations, integer division operation as well. All right. So let's write our plan, okay? So first step of formal of my plan should be get the input. So it's really clear you have to get the input. So input. So in this case, a number. So okay. And second, now I have the number. Now I need to extract the number. Okay. So since I already know how to extract numbers and I'll explain, I can now directly start formulating my output. OK. 
Okay, so output is the reverse number, right? So reversed number equals. I'm going to expand a little bit. Okay. All right. So so let's use the formula we formulated over here. So first comes the first digit times thousand. Right. So let's say digit one times thousand plus now we can write two times hundred plus three times ten plus four times one. That's the formula I came up with. Okay. So I write that down there. So now this is the formula. So let's first, I'm going to go here. So this is not the step two. Okay. So let's first fi uh, find out digit one. Okay. So second step equals how do we find this digit? In this case, one, two, three, four. How do we find four? Okay. So, and it's basically if I take the remainder division by uh, 10, right? If I divide this by 10 and get the remainder, it's actually four. So, in this case, a number. integer division, sorry, remainder by 10. This result would be four if the number is this, okay? That's digit one. So number, sorry, number three step is finding the digit two, okay? So, and this could be a little bit tricky, okay? So to get the digit two, which in this case, number three, digit three, okay? So uh, second digit is the three, it's three. So basically I need to extract first this 34. Once I get the 34, then I can divide it by, get the remainder by 10, uh, uh, sorry, in integer by chain, sorry, I get three, okay? So first I need to extract 34 out of this number. To extract 34, I can get the remainder of division by 100. Oh, is that, yes, okay, 100, okay? So basically, if I write it over here, so three equals one, two, three, four. If I take the remainder of division by 100, this equal 34, okay? And now I have, when I, when I, once I do this, I have 34. Once I have 34, I use integer division, sorry, yeah, integer division, By 10. Okay, that equals 3. All right. So, in other words, 34 integer division by 10 gives me 3. Okay, that's the second digit. So, that's why it's a two step process. First, we need to get the remainder, and then, then the whole thing need to get the integer division. I right, said so that's we found digit 3. So, step 4. So digit three also sort of similar, okay? Digit three 
basically we need to find 234 which is the remainder of 1000 and get the division by 100 and you can see the pattern okay so we did three this two over here to find that first we need to extract 234 out of one two three four okay and then basically get the integer division by 100 use to use us two okay. all right so digit four is easy so all right basically i'm gonna copy this and is four is actually integer division by thousand okay All right so digit okay so this gives us in this case one okay all right so we found out this this how extract each digit how you extract each digit so we need to now apply it over here okay so the sixth step is this okay and that's it so we found out the reverse number okay so let's convert this into code okay so i am going to do this so that i can easily copy this down okay all right implementation First input, that means the input function. Oops. All right, input. So that means a number, that's the input that equals input and can get the prompt. And we have to convert, remember, we need to convert it to an int. This is a string. All right, so we have the number now. Now we need to extract the term. You can, I, I usually recommend do everything in this step. You can do that. But this, since this is our first time, I'm going to find each and every variable. Okay. So, in this case, now this is our algorithm. Notice it's really close to the code we write, right? So I always recommend write your algorithm as much as possible to your code, if possible. At least has the meaning, like in this case, input. So I know I have to use input function, likewise, All right? So the next one is digit two. And the next one is digit three. And the next one, digit four. Now, and this is the formula that we have for the, <coughs> excuse me. All right. So, so we are good. So in the print in the review part, let's print this value. Okay. Okay, reverse number. All right. So if something goes wrong, that's part of the review and debugging process. So analysis comes next. Okay. So let's check this out with any number. So you can first check our example. So I'm gonna enter one, two, three, four. All right, I got the number four, three, two, one. I can run one more time. Four, three, two, one. I get one, two, three, four. So it works in this case, no problem. But if the problem is too complex, there's a good chance that you may not get the everything in the first implementation. Don't worry. Once you get a part done 
and you can go back and then think about what needs to happen next. And then that's what usually I do. First, solve a part of the problem. If the problem is too complex, then all the way go to the review step and run it and make sure that works and then go back and then work out the rest. Okay. All right, there you have it, the umpire process practice. And please, please follow this technique and I guarantee by the end of this course, you will be an expert of problem solving using umpire technique. Okay. And who knows in your software engineer intern interview, you may be able to implement in there as well. Okay. All right. So let's move on to our rest of the lesson. So we go here. I'm going to move back to our presentation. Okay. So we solve this problem. Okay. All right. Our next topic, next big topic is learning about Python functions. Okay, so before that, let's talk about some real world functions. Okay, what's a real world function? And it, they're everywhere. Like if you take a printer, it's prints, can print something that's, that's a function. If you take a car, car can drive. So that's a function. If you walk and you accomplish walking, that's a function as well. So in real world, it's a single task okay. and it has a name. It's often an action or a behavior. So if I walk, the walk function, the action is the walk. So it's specified by the, the verb walk. Or a behavior. Okay. So we know that English language uses verbs to describe functions, which is actions or behaviors. So in real world too, a given function solve a single task. And we refer to that function by its name, which is the respect to verb. Okay. And sometimes we decorate that verb as well to make it more specific. Okay. Like printing a paper. Right. So it's now specific in which to printing a paper. Okay. Printing a 3D model. So now it's specific to printing 3D printing. So we have the verb and we decorate it, okay? So that's the way in, in software world as well that happens, okay? So in programming world, it is the same, basically. We solve, because we solve real world problems in programming. So it has to be same. It must be same. If it is not same, then we're gonna end up complicated scenarios on solving problems we had because there is no one-to-one -one correspondence between the software world and the, the real world. If there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between software world and the real world, solution is easy. Okay. All right. So basically, if the English meaning and the language meaning are the same, programming language means are the same, then it's easy to solve the problem. That's what I earlier said. You need to have that one-to-one -one correspondence. Basically, we use functions. We have functions in the real world. We take the same concept into pro programming world and then we solve particular tasks in functions. Okay. So, Many programming languages has the print function to print to the standard output. That is similar to like printing into a paper in the physical world, real world. Okay. So we have the printf in C, print in 
I then print in, uh, sorry, uh, C in, C, uh, C out in, in C++, likewise, okay? So, we have a name sort of similar to the real world name. In this case, printing to a paper, we do the same in, in software, but we are printing to the screen now. Okay. All right. So basically, software function two sold a particular task. Okay. So that means it sold a particular task, it uses a single chunk of code and sold a particular task. So let's define a Python function. It's basically a named sequence that is really important named function has a name sequence of code that belong together so that basically that says okay they solve a particular problem that's why it's belong together okay so code that belong together is the task that we accomplish using the function Name sequence is that task, basically, okay? So it's the name of the task, okay? All right, so how do we, so how do we write a function? You need to identify the verb, verbs in your English, problem statements, algorithm, those things, right? So we need to identify that verb. So look for the verbs and there's a good chance that those verb may end up being functions. Not always, not all of them. But there's a good chance that they may be functions in your solution, okay? So one really good way of identifying functions is to track down the verbs in your problem statement, okay? And you can do this as a, as a step in your umpire process as well. You know, just get a pen and then highlight all the verbs and then, then you can filter them out. Okay, do I need a function for with this verb or not? Okay, all right. And then usually, like I said earlier, verbs come with the decoration behind it and we call them adverbs. So um, yeah, adjective or adverbs. I forgot anyway, uh, like for example, printing a paper. So what do we print? So the decoration is a paper now. So there's now speciality there. So print a paper. So uh, in that way, you can be more specific about your task that you solve in your function, okay? All right, let's see what are the purpose. What is the purpose of writing function? And that's a bunch, okay? you can organize your code because you are solving a single problem in this particular piece of code. So that way you have a bunch of them separated. So it's a, it's a really nice organization pattern. And that set of code has a name that you can refer to, okay? That's an organization. You can reuse, you can call anywhere the, pro, the the pattern needed basically all right so you call that you can call that function to repeat anywhere it needed so you can use you can reuse code basically call that function again if the problem is too complex you, know, you can break it down into smaller chunks of tasks notice the plural over here so so you can identify set of tasks and then solve each task separately in a function. Okay, so that way you can sort of build a, a larger solution to a complex problem. And functions, it's all about black boxing, basically, you can focus on what to do, not how to do, okay? 
So how to do is basically pay more attention to solving that particular problem. But initially you can focus what needs to do, right? You can focus, we call it black boxing basically. So focus on the tasks need to accomplish rather than how to accomplish the task. So in real world also, it's, it's, it's similar and we don't, when we use the cook function in a microwave, we are not worrying about how it does the cooking. We, we are worrying about whether it can do the cooking or not. So which is the task, right? It's similar in software as well. All right. So let's see how Python's function syntax, all right? Well, we have seen it already, right? So that's the reason that I immerse you guys already with this. So we use the def keyword and then the function name. Always use a descriptive name. It usually start with a verb and then you can attach the decorative component of the task by separating each, each of them with the underscore, okay. So this is the usual convention in naming a, a function. And you have seen that not only function and variable names too, I have been using that same process in naming throughout. And then sometimes name become too large, but it's, it's basically, it's now a habit to me because I have been doing this for years now. It's a habit now. I'm basically now reluctant to, even for a silly variable name, I'm reluctant to use abstract names, basically. I am into writing these expressive names. It's now a habit to me. Okay? So make it so by, you know, doing it again and again. That's how we form good habits. We, we do it again and again, like brushing our teeth twice a day. It's a habit because we do it every day. Same way in coding also, okay. All right, then you can, there are, there can be optional parameters to functions. We're gonna learn about that later. Every function need to have a doc string, okay. It's not mandatory, but it's in Python's own standards. In, in real world coding convention, it is recommended, it's a standard. Okay, so let's say you are function do this task and then you can start off with that verb and then say this is what the fun function does. So it's a good practice and there are component in Python, modules in Python that can extract this doc string and create documentation. And that's the, the important usage of this. So there are Python modules who can run it through, let's say, a big program and then create a documentation out of these doc strings, okay? So, and we use the um, single, three single quotes or three, uh, three, three double quotes to write the doc string, okay? And then you can need to have at least one statement inside both the doc string and the statements need to be have at least one tab from the left side or four spaces okay both the doc string and the statement at least need to have one statement okay all right so that's the syntax and in the syntax these parameters there's a specific name for that. We call them formal parameters, okay? All right, so in the definition, it's really important that in the definition, we call these parameters formal parameters. All right, so let's talk about code. So we wrote our solution. We wrote the, the implementation of the function. So how do we use it? Okay, we simply call it, all right? So how do we call? So 
function name and we pass the actual parameters now okay if it has some parameters we need to pass that parameters now so actual means this is where we use our function so we have to those are the actual thing that we are going to pass so for example we have been already using the built-in function print and we pass several times uh, some of these strings so in this case hello world so that's the actual parameter to print function okay so so this is the call all right parameters in the call the actual parameters sometimes we also call them function arguments okay all right python function can call another function and then can also define inside its own function as well we call them nesting okay so you can call another function in your function as well as you can define one of your own inside as well okay inside another as well and defining another function inside another it's not that very common okay but in the future we'll see examples all right let's let us now practice with functions okay so to practice we have a problem okay the so problem is write a python function to print the greeting welcome to the screen and we have already done that in the hello world example but nevertheless let's write our function okay so um so let's i'm gonna go over here and and the function so since this is a really sim simple example oops all right so we can directly write our code okay so basically we need to write a function to print welcome to the screen okay so i would say print that's my word first word and welcome All right so that's the specification what i'm printing welcome okay so no parameters just inside okay write our doc string prints to the screen okay so one um, benefit of this triple code is you can include single code ones or even double code ones inside and now we print okay in this case welcome all right so that's it we wrote our function so we're going to call it now okay so what slide number i think oh i need to do okay it's 12 okay so let's go to over here in the main program that actually is slide number 12 okay and so, oops I think it should be let me copy this one yep all right 12 and we're gonna call our function okay and let's run this okay so yeah let me run this oh um, i'm gonna block this because otherwise i need to enter all of these all right stop it and run it again 
say my awesome today is okay on it again there you go okay printed welcome okay so it works okay so let's move on so that example was, so we wrote this one. Basically, it's a simple, silly task of printing this message, welcome to the screen. So nothing fancy, okay. So it was, the code was too specific, right? Because our function can only print the message, welcome. That's not good, right? Because in, in, in software, basically we say, write once and use, many times so use anywhere right so that means we should be we should try to write a general solution to a problem not a specific solution all right so so when you are too specific you cannot reuse your code because it's already too specific okay so do your best to find the general solution, the most general solution. And in fact, it, it's really, basically the engineers try to do that, okay? So trying to find the most general solution. In Java, we call them generics. And those who came coming from Java, we call, there's a name for that generic programming. Basically, you can uh, write a lot of like, type independent, value independent code and and then that's basically a general solution provide a general solution okay so try your best to do that so how do we generalize this problem then like especially in functions writing function what are the ways of generalizing your your code okay one way of doing that is use of parameters, okay? So in this case, we can pass our greeting message as a parameter and print that parameter instead of just using only welcome, right? So use of parameter is one way of generalizing. So let's generalize our solution using parameters, okay? So now the problem is, it's problem also general. Now it's asking, write a Python function to print any greeting to the screen. Use your function to print the specific greeting, okay? So let's generalize our solution now, okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy this and paste again and well, I'm going to change the name to print message. Okay, excuse me. Okay, print message. Oh, def. All right. And now I'm going to pass, <coughs> excuse me, pass my message. Okay. So, And then over here, just print the message. That's all. It's a little simple. So instead of being specific inside, we take whatever we need to print from outside as a parameter, and then we print that parameter. Okay. All right. So let's call this guy now. Okay. All right. So that's in slide 13. So let me just first create that. Okay. So instead of all these, okay. So Functions. Okay. 
let's call this inside I'll, I'll reformat don't worry can move on otherwise we'll be wasting time so we need a we need a message now right so so my message is going to be welcome okay so that's our specific message now so that we get it in a main program that's really important that you understand the difference this message is not the message that i have in my function so this is now in the main program okay and print message so i pass this message to my message printer function and it's going to print that okay so all right it printed welcome okay and let's say well message is different now okay so just the hi all right so you write again and you'll see that hi is printed so now see earlier function only could print welcome now this can this function can print any message that we pass into that so that's the difference okay so our solution is more general now this function can print anything that we pass into that and this one only welcome right okay all right so move on so how do we solve a complex problem using functions so complex let's take an example a little bit more complex solution so problem for this okay so if we try to solve it in a single function and that's going to be hard and it's not recommended because the problem is complex so there's got to be more than one task if we still try to solve it in a single function it's a bad design because it's not a particular task but you are now trying to use a single function to accomplish a number of tasks which is a bad design okay so we need to first identify the task by identifying verbs like i discussed earlier okay and once you identify them and we can write our solution and combine them to solve that complex problem so here's the problem write the python function to print any greeting to any person use your solution to greet the person dora with nice to meet welcome message i think i made a mistake over there i think nice to meet you dora something like that okay but let's figure it out in the solution okay i'll correct before i post the slide okay so let's go over here okay so we, the, the the problem is now a little bit if this all hypothetically and not that serious right but it's still a little bit more complex problem now so we need to print this message to a person a given person okay so we already have the message printing solution so we need to use that in a different solution so what's that verb is basically let's try to figure out the verb oops okay write a python function to print any greeting to any person so now it's it, there are two things over here so printing a greeting and printing a greeting to any person okay so that means we have to basically write another function okay dev print oh let's say greet so we are we are going to greet 
to this person. So that verb is greet. So over here, right? Sorry. Greet. Yeah. So print a greeting to any person. So greet. Let's say greet. Greet person. Okay. So now can write the doc string. Greet a person. <clears throat> Excuse me. So in this case now we need to take the message. So what kind of a greeting do we so message and person. So we need the person too, who the person is. Right. So let's say greet a person with the message. So that's remember in to include these two parameters also in your doc string. Okay. And you can form that. You can form that phrase. It's a single sentence that says this is what this function does. So greet the person. Person means this person we pass with the message. This message. All right. So what we can do now we know how to get the message printed. So in this case, if you if you want an example, it's like nice to meet you, Dora. Okay, needs to be printed. So let's say that's what we have to print. So basically, we first get the print the message. So print the message. And what do we pass? We pass this message and it get printed over here. Okay. And then we print person. Okay. And we'll test it out. And if we need the modification, we'll modify that as well. Okay. So let's get this one over here. I'm going to run it over here and I'll, I'll change it to the different slide. Okay. So, so message is now different. Okay. It's nice to meet you. Okay. So that's the message and the person is Dora. All right, so let's take this out and you'll we'll see that we need to modify things, okay? Don't worry, okay? And see that we got it printed, nice to meet you, Dora, but they are in two different lines. So let's fix that as well. So in this case, what you can do is to print in a single line, right here, we say end equals, this is a formal syntax to do that. And whatever the symbol that you want to end. So default end symbol for print is the new line character, which is which makes the next line goes to the next printing character goes to the next line. But you can change it by providing the end parameter to print. Oops, sorry, I think I made a mistake take over here. So it's not here. Not here. Sorry. Should be should go to the print function over here. All right. So we're going to change this into end equals. So in the print function, the default end parameter is new line character. So that's why once we print in Python simply the next, next one we're going to print goes into the next line. So we can change it by providing that character here, in this case, space. Okay. 
So end equals space, then basically the next line is going to print comes after this message. Okay. So let's check this out now. Okay. All right, we got it. Nice to meet you, Dora. Okay. So we can we don't need to run this. So let me just block this for now and run it again. We get nice to meet you. All right. So we now know how to call a function in another. So we wrote the one and we call it in another, okay? All right. So basically by doing so, we solved a complex problem, a little bit com complex. Just this is a silly example, but you get the point, right? So. All right, so let's move on. Function return value. Okay, so if we, if we again go back to real world, function has a return value. If you take a printer, For example, it gives us the printed page. That's the return product. Okay, printer gives us the return printed paper. Okay. If you use like like function like walk, run, it simply accomplish the task without returning anything. Okay, and then there are many ways to interpret that as well. One say, okay, why by walking we, we we return a good health or those stuff, right? But if you take it, it basically accomplished the task of walking, but no return, just no touchable product return, right? So you can interpret that as like function that return nothing. Okay. So Basically, in walk, we say it returns nothing, just accomplishes the, the walking task. So in Python, we use return statement to return a value. So today is the first day that you're going to return the keyword, return keyword. You're going to learn the return keyword. All right, in this class. So in Python, function always returns a value. Okay, but that value, okay, so we use return keyword to return that value, okay. That value may be none, okay. Okay, we call it none type as well, okay. Simply none, okay. So the return value defaults to none type then we don't use the return statement. It's really important for you to understand that when we don't use the return statement, the function's return value defaults to none type or none, simply none, okay? So function returning a value, we call them fruitful function. We get a return, right? So we get a fruit out of it. So we call it fruitful function. Function that doesn't return a value, we call them non-fruitful functions, okay? So here is the thing that you have to do. Never use, now we, so far we have been using print statement in function to print to the output screen. But if your function must return a value, never, never print use print to return, ask, return that value, okay? And I'll show you why, okay? So you, you must return that value, you must use the return statement, okay? If you use print, if you print that value, then the return value will be none, okay? So, and this may be if you, 
if your solution expecting a return value but then you are returning none this could be problematic as well and we'll do a simple example too okay so syntax for returning a value is basically return statement is return reverse reserved word and and then after that you put the whatever the return value okay so let me now explain what is this uh, return value of uh, non fruitful function so this is a non fruitful function all of the functions that i so far have written are non fruitful function because they don't return anything they just print to the screen okay so all these three functions are non fruitful functions so i'm going to here excuse me <clears throat> So in here, so let's, rather than calling this, I'm going to print the type of it, okay? Type. So I'm not calling it, I'm going to print the type of it, okay? All right, so let's run this again and see what the outcome see that it's non type okay now imagine so this is the return value of the, the function that we wrote now imagine you are expecting an integer to be returned but you use instead you use print inside and the return value will not will be not integer it will be non type now imagine you use that function in a calculation with another function that function expect another integer but this is non type now there is the problem your program going to simply crash okay all right so and we can test an example later okay all right so let's move on so let's practice with function returning a value All right, write a Python function to return the greeting welcome to the screen, okay? So we're gonna basically now use the return keyword and rewrite this function, okay? So I'm gonna go back, okay? Now it's really simple. Instead of just printing the, the value, we're gonna return that's it so return this message that's right okay so that's it so now let's use this function so you'll see i'm going to use it over here so i'm going to block all this okay and just call so I'm gonna call this welcome to second version of it. So simply call it. Okay, and see what happened. Let's run it. Okay. So well nothing happened. Let's see. Um, I just I'm gonna block this one too. Okay. All right, see, nothing happened. See, there's no message printed, okay? So the reason is simple. I return the value, okay? So when I return, basically that's value is generated, but no one is printing to see it. Now in the main program, you got to print the function that is returning, okay? It's really important, okay? So this guy returns a value correct, but that guy doesn't print it there, right? So it prints. So this guy has that value returned, but to see it, I need to print it. So it's really important that you do it. So now I see the message welcome get printed, okay? So in the function 
we return the value, the implementation, okay? And in the call, we need to print it. So the difference between the fruitful, uh, one different between fruitful function and non-fruitful function, in order to see the result, of a fruitful function, you need to print it in the main program. For non-fruitful function, you just call it in the main program because print it already there inside the, the function, like right here, right? Print it already there. All right, so let's move on. So let's, we, we said like function, we can use function like as back boxes. All right, so that means we can actually draw that diagram, okay? So functions are black boxes, okay? So drawing one is a good understand step, okay? So please consider drawing one. So once you are done with the, the understand the written stuff or drawing stuff, then basically you can sorry, the workout stuff, then you can actually draw this black box, black, sorry, black box diagram, okay? So for non-fruitful function, here's how you draw the black, uh, black box diagram. So let me just uh, bring it more towards the left, okay, there you go. Okay, now I see the slide number, okay. So, This is non-fruitful function. So it's basically take parameters. In this case, I have just two parameters. So we, we write them like needs. So we use the box to write the function name and we use an arrow key towards the function to indicate, okay, these are the input. So parameter one, parameter two, it's not a fruitful function, doesn't return anything. So there's no out going arrow but in the case of fruitful function you have a return value so there's outgoing arrows okay so it needs parameter one parameter two it's a fruitful function it returns a value so we indicate them from outward arrow and we write the return value the description or the variable name over here okay all right make a habit to draw a black box diagram. That's also really good habit, okay. All right, so <clears throat> function parameters, we already learned some of the things with function parameters, okay. So we're gonna learn more on the function parameters. There can be any number of function parameters, okay. And some of them can be default as well. And we already saw with the print, print built-in function, the, the default end character is new line character. So it's, it's right here. I have used new line character. This is the one, it's the new line character. Next, your, the, what the thing you print goes to the next line. So yes, you can, have, have default parameters and this is how you write function definition with default parameters. For example, in this syntax, we have the function name, parameter one, it's a normal parameter and the rest of the parameters has a default value. So we can write it like this, parameter name equals that default value. Parameter name equals that default value. Okay. And we have to list them only after the rest of the non-default parameters, okay? And we're gonna learn more on that later in throughout the class. So you, ha you, can, you have several ways to call now. One is you let the Python take the default values. That means you don't pass the, the, the uh, default parameters. So you just pass only the non-default parameter and then function run with the default ones. So in this case, default values for argument two and three, Python takes those. 
but if you want to replace those before values, then you actually pass the value that you want to replace with. Okay. So that way also works. Okay. All right. So let's now practice with default parameters, okay? So the problem is write a Python function to print any greeting message with the default greeting, welcome to the screen. All right, so we're gonna go back to our coding. So I'm gonna go over here, right here. And welcome three. Now it takes a parameter message. Now, in this case, it is the only default parameter. So I'm going to put it like this equals welcome. Or maybe we'll, we'll, we'll do that as well. Okay. So all right, so return message. Well, I think I'll take it back. Sorry about that. Um, I'm going to use this, okay? Because this is the one that we pass, all right? So message, so I'm going to Use this print message. So default message equals welcome. Okay, and and then print message. Okay, so let's. So this is the two second version of it. I'm going to first call it. Call it like this with the with the message. Okay, in this case hi. Okay. All right. So let's print. Yep. It's the only one that I'm gonna print. So I printed hi, but if I don't pass this, so let me just call it again without anything. And we'll see it's gonna print welcome. Okay, so I need to remove that. Okay, let's um, remove it over here. So let's remove this one. So that's why it printed together. Okay, so call it again. And now print welcome. So default message. Okay, and let's convert. Let's see how we can convert this one to that. So I'm gonna swap these two because I need to make the default parameter. Message is the default parameter, okay, person, okay. Whoops, I'm gonna, all right, so let's copy this and then change that. Otherwise, you guys should be confused. Okay, all right, so two, that, oh, not that, sorry over here the second one two in this case i'm going to swap this to person comes first because just be, only because i need to make the message is the default one not the person because non-default uh, arguments should come first okay parameters should come first and then the default parameters so in this case this is welcome all right, so now we have a little bit more um, of a message, more uh, in the in the complex solutions. Let's call it greet person two. So block this and. Person is going to be Dora. And let's just do this. 
and let's see if we can if it can take yeah so welcome dora okay and if you pass a message let's run it again oops it should be a string hi and run it hi dora okay so we so this is basically first call is with the default parameter okay all right one all right so let's talk about the scope of a variable okay this is really a big topic but i'm going to introduce immerse you in here for now but we're going to revisit when we discuss python execution model we're going to discuss in detail on the scope okay so visibility of a variable is called the scope so if that function if, if any given variable visible to a function we call it okay the scope of that function is, is visible to that function so scope of that variable is in that function so so basically visibility of a variable we call it the scope of that variable okay so variables defined inside a function and that defined has a broader meaning okay it's visible only inside okay so we say the scope of such variable is local okay outside variable so variables defined outside so that mean any scope outside of local and those variable we call them global variables okay all right so i, I should have said this is global scope okay it's kind of misleading over here it should it's not misleading but it's the better phrasing is glo global scope okay so global variables are actually bad okay so avoid global variables okay and i'll probably when we do the execution model i'll show you guys examples but basically when you use global variables your function can see them so one purpose of global variable is having to use it anywhere in your program let's say your function accidentally changed that global variable now the rest of the program see that change variable and if one of those functions accept the original value now you get a wrong value and you are still you wrote the perfectly right code your program runs but it gives you a wrong result so it's a so it's really hard to digest logical error so that kind of logical error is really difficult to track down because your program works so that's why okay so local variable visible only to function they belong outside scope can see them so that means basically those local variables are invisible to outside so they cannot change them and they die basically once the function did it course so once the function done running basically local variables dies with it so that's a good optimization strategy as well rather than keeping bunch of global variables you replace them inside each particular functions as local variables so once it runs done running basically those memory reclaimed but if you but if you keep global variables they're going to stay there forever as long as your program runs so it's an optimization strategy as well so function like i said the functions have access to global variables 
that other entities in your program depends on and it might change accidentally so that happens it's it's really hard to track logical error can happen all right guys so that is the the functions lesson for this module i hope to see you all in the next module